this morning as we come to worship you and as we stand before you we become aware of our own sinfulness and your holiness and we ask you Lord as we are gathered here to listen to your word that you will speak to us that you will be present Lord and that you will bring us closer to yourself in Jesus name Amen I'm going to read Romans 3 from verse 9 to 20 what shall we conclude then are we any better not at all we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin as it is written there is no one righteous not even one there is no one who understands no one who seeks God all have turned away they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. This chapter contains something of the heart of the gospel it speaks about the total corruption of mankind it tells us that all people are under sin under the power of sin we are not sinning just occasionally but we are enslaved to sin no human effort through all the ages were able to conquer the power of sin. One of the most important truths that Christianity must hold up in the modern world is that all human beings, even though created in God's image, are corrupted by the power of sin. We are not morally good by nature. We are morally bad by nature. In Ephesians 2 verse 3 Paul says we are all by nature children of wrath. The attitudes and the thoughts and the actions that deserve the wrath of God come from us by nature. And when we sin it brings guilt and separation and it has terrible consequences. And the stubborn self-pride of people keeps them from confessing their sin before God and they therefore remain in darkness. The message about our sin is not a popular message today but it is a hope-giving and a life-producing message. In spite of all this bad news about our own condition there is a remedy and the only reason for telling us the bad news is so that we will understand the remedy and take it namely the righteousness of God freely given to those who really trust in Christ that is why the first element of the gospel is to confront people with the reality of sin the word gospel means good news and the good news it offers is the way of salvation from sin until a person is convicted of his sin the gospel has nothing to offer today the false gospel and the cheap gospel wants to bypass the seriousness of sin 
Paul knows that men tend to resist the reality of their sinfulness. So in summing up this portion, he wants to make a final strong statement about the utter and the total sinfulness of man. He now presents the ultimate testimony of the Bible, of Scripture. He mentioned in the first few chapters that creation testifies of our sinfulness, that our conscience tells us that we are in the wrong. But now he brings in the testimony of the Bible. We read in verse 9, What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. And here Paul identifies himself with his fellow Jews by using the word we. By asking, are we superior to those others? Were we saved because of our basic human nature that was on a higher level than that of other people? Is it because of our own goodness that God saved us? And immediately he answered his own question by saying, not at all. No, we are not in ourselves any better than any other person. The entire human race, with absolutely no exception, is on trial before God and his court of justice, because he says, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin, He talked about everybody from the most immoral, vile and vice-ridden person to a person who gathers with the community of the believers and says, none of us is any better than the other. By our human nature, we are all equal guilty of sin before God. What Paul has in mind here is that every human being both Jews and Greeks, are all under completely in bondage to the dominion of sin. Such an idea was unthinkable for most Jews. And even today, people who are very religious tend to think of themselves as being better than others and favored by God because of their goodness and because of their religion. Even Christians are sometimes tempted to think that God saved them because they were somehow more deserving of salvation than other people. But if a person ever becomes right with God, it is never because they are better than anyone else or because they have managed to bring their life up to God's standard or because they zealously observe certain religious practices. It is only because they have acknowledged their sin and helplessness and came in humble faith before the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness and cleansing. In verse 10 we read as it is written, There is no one righteous, not even one. And Paul presents here the biblical charges against fallen mankind. The charge comes directly from the Old Testament. He says it is written, indicating this is a permanent issue. It is written and it is implying it is divinely, by divine authority. So this is God speaking on the sinfulness of man. It's not a view of a theologian. It's not a view of a minister. It's God speaking through his word. And he's referring to Psalm 14 verse 1, where we read, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. There is no one who does good. And Paul is using the term righteous in its most basic sense of being right before God. Of being as God created man to be. People are able to do many good things in life. Things that are morally right. And Paul points out that there is not a single person that has ever lived apart from Christ 
who could be characterized as righteous by God's standards. By human standards, we can say somebody is good. But God's standard is a standard of perfect righteousness, of perfection. As Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 48, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That is God's standard. And according to that standard, there is no person that can be acceptable before God because God's standard of righteousness is a perfect standard. People are not only universally evil, but also spiritually evil ignorant quoting again from the Psalms Paul says there is none who understands people have no spiritual capacity to know or understand God he loves so much in darkness 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14 tells us the natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness to him the natural man, the unsaved person, cannot understand the things of God. It's foolishness. In his letter to the Ephesians, the apostle points out that the people's ignorance is not due to outward circumstances, their lack of opportunity. It is only due to their sinful nature, he tells us, because they does not want to understand God. People choose darkness before light. Unsaved persons are like Ephesians 4 verse 8 and tells us darkened in their understanding. Excluded from the life of God. So deep have we fallen in sin. That we live in darkness. We do not have the life of God. And it brings ignorance. In addition of being universally evil and spiritually ignorant, people are also rebellious. There is none who seeks for God. If we look at the vast number of religions in the world, one would think that a great many people are diligently seeking after God. But a recent newspaper article said that overall in the world there is an increase in religious interest. More people are religious than ever before. But that does not mean they seek after God. Because the Bible makes it clear and this, in this passage and many others that all religious systems and efforts are in reality an attempt to escape the true God and to discover and manufacture their own false gods, gods of their own liking. Because any man-made religion a human and demon inspired and it's an escape from God and not an effort to find God. God becomes for those who really seek him, the focus of their lives. As David tells us in Psalm 16 verse 8, I have set the Lord continually before me. Those who seek the Lord with all their heart, they will find him because God becomes the focus of everything, the source of everything, the beginning and the end of everything. They do not disobey and rebel against him. They truly seek for God they respect and adore his majesty and they feed on the word and his truths. They love to obey his commandments. They love to speak in prayer to him and they live consciously in his presence with a desire to please him. And no one can do that naturally. They need the power of the Holy Spirit working within them. Paul continues by saying, that people are naturally wayward. He declares that all have turned aside from God. A people who is naturally evil, ignorant of God's truth, and naturally rebellious against God, will also naturally live apart from God's will. They have turned aside, and it basically means 
of leaning in the wrong direction. It speaks of a universal human inclination to go against God's way. And it's all over in the world. It's all around us. As Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 53 verse 6, All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. That's the nature of, of people. We do what is right in our own eyes. The evangelist Dwight L. Moody told to have been asked by a warden of a large prison in New York City to speak to the prisoners. And because there was no chapel or other suitable safe place to speak to the group, he preached at one end of a large row of cells. And unable to see the face of a single prisoner, after the message he asked the permission to talk face to face with some of the people through the bars of their cells. He soon discovered that most of the prisoners had not even been listening to his message. When Moody would ask a prisoner why he was in prison, the man almost always declared his innocence. He would insist that a false witness testified against him or that he was mistaken for a person who really committed the crime or that the judge or jury was prejudiced against him or he would give some other reason he was unjustly imprisoned. And Moody said he was beginning to get discouraged. But when I had gotten almost through all the cells, I found a man with his elbows on his knees and two streams of tears running down his cheek, I looked in at the little window and said, My friend, what is your trouble? He looked up with despair and remorse on his face and said, My sins are more than I can bear. And I said, Thank God for that. The evangelist was thankful because he knew that no man is open to God's way until he forsakes his own way, but he will not seek salvation until he admits he is lost. That's also the purpose of this few first chapters of the book of Romans, to bring us to the point of acknowledging our sins and that we are lost. Paul is the natural man. I have together become worthless. Apart from a saving relationship with Christ, a person is spiritually dead, a dead branch, totally unable to produce any fruit, and measured by God's standard of righteousness, righteousness, the natural man has no ability to do anything upright and good. If this is who we really are by nature. And that is God's description in the Old and the New Testament. Namely that people, all people, are under sin. And therefore as Romans 1 verse 18 tells us, it says because we are under sin, we are also under the wrath of God. But when we know that, when it's the best news in the world, and that is the entire focus of the book of Romans and the whole Bible and Christianity, and it is that that God, against whom we have sinned, in His great mercy has made a way of salvation from sin. He has made a way of salvation from the power of sin and the penalty of sin. And if today you will come and believe in Jesus Christ, and turn from your sin, and renounce all forms of self-salvation, the very righteousness of God will be yours as a gift, replacing your own unrighteousness, and that is the reason why Christ suffered and died on the cross. And that is why I can just ask for everyone aware of their own lostness and sinfulness, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God, Trust in Him for His great and wonderful salvation. Amen.
Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that by your spirit we can become aware of our own sinfulness and lostness. That your word assure us that there is one way of salvation and that is through Christ, through the cross. That you cover us with your, unrighteous, your righteousness if we are willing to get rid of our unrighteousness. Our own efforts to save ourselves and to turn to you by faith and by your grace. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.